test. Does that work? Great. Can you guys hear me too? All right. Um, so I was told to give the AV guys a thumbs up, and apparently I did that, and I was the first guy that managed to do that today, so I'm really happy about that. Um, unfortunately, this is the second last talk for today, so um, do enjoy it, and uh, welcome uh, Lee um, with me, who is a software engineer and open source enthusiast, and I think he, he certainly won the prize for the most comprehensive um, bio there. Um, but he's going to talk um, about Pyth Python as a service, or platform, platform as a service, in Python. So um, please welcome Lee. So hi, I'm Lee. I do not work for Mozilla. Um, I'll just start with that because you'll see why later. Um, but I've been in Python for a few years now and I've been doing Django websites in my own time for various people as well as myself. And I sort of was looking at what I could do and, um, and how I would host them because uh, like everybody, I probably started with, well, well like that. Like a lot of people, I started with uh, Mod Python, do not use today. Um, so I'll just go over um, what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to talk about what is a platform as a service, um, my approach and a few alternatives that are out there, and uh, what I think might be important in the future. Um, so what is platform as a service, um, initialized as P-A-A-S? Um, it's where you're provided a runtime environment and you operate within that environment only. Uh, this is different from, say, what you might call cloud computing, which is often referred to as infrastructure as a service, where you get a virtual machine and then you can set up your own runtime environment within that. Within that. Um, almost all of the particularly commercial ones are built on infrastructure as a service because it gives them a great way to scale out. Um, and it really is about providing um, the facilities that are needed by your app and not having to worry about managing the operating system or the database server or something like that. Um, and as this diagram nicely points out, it's very much used as a way of delivering software as a service applications. Um, just because it allows the people focusing on selling that not to have to worry about the levels below. So you concentrate on the bit that you do well. Um, so in a Python context, uh, what does this look like? Well, most of the time it is a WSGI service. So Whiskey, um, the web service gateway interface. Um, in some environments, you're really just given an HTTP socket that uh, you connect to, and then you run your own um, WSGI server on that. Um, mainly because there's kind of a few different ones out there. So um, the most common um, whiskey interface is uh, Mod Whiskey and Apache. Who runs that? A few people? All right. Who runs Green Unicorn? A few people. Who runs uh, U-Whiskey? few, slightly more, actually, interesting. Who runs something that's really unusual and not one of those? Okay, me. Um, platforms as a service also tend to provide a variety of services that are just injected straight in that are available straight away um, without configuration. And generally they're injected through some sort of configuration or um, environment variables or something like that. And databases are the key one among those. Um, so you don't have to go set up a database access and things like that. You generally just provided it. Um, you can also get other services like um, uh, caching services, caching servers, um, mail server, uh, mail relay, etc. Um, and almost always they're inside some sort of virtual environment, um, VM, a virtual VM, um, and that allows that multiple customers on the same platform. Often there's some sort of containerization or some sort of isolation. Um, so that there's no, uh, you're not fixed to the libraries that are provided. You can choose your own. Um, yeah, so my approach, and don't worry, I'll come back to the slide, uh, is to bring together a few open source uh, pieces and uh, put them together. So I use uh, Nginx 
as uh, the sort of front-end um, web server. And that just does static media and then proxies on to Circus D, which provides process management and socket management. And she'll set us my WSGI server. Uh, Git for version control, Fabric and Cuisine, and Django environment um, for retrieving the configuration. Um, so I use it to host a variety of sites, of course, my own. <laughs> uh, Rec file check, which, I hope, which I'll be talking about in the Lightning Talks tomorrow. Uh, a not exactly secret project. Uh, a failed startup, um, a Civic Hackathon website, uh, a GovHack project from this year, uh, and all on one virtual machine with one gig of RAM and one CPU um, for less than $30 a month. So by having uh, using your resources efficiently, you can get a lot into a single small virtual machine. Um, and that's one of the advantages of doing it this way. Um, there's a single, only a single um, web server, and it's relatively lightweight. Um, it's not quite as complicated as, uh, uh, sorry, not as quite as heavyweight as Apache's WSGI, mod WSGI daemon workers. Um, and there's lots of optimizations I could make, which I haven't done yet. Um, so just going back to the approach, I'm now going to go quickly through some of these. Um, and uh, uh, talk about how they fit together. Um, so um, most of the sites, I, well, all the sites I host are Django web applications. So they have a separation of static files and media. Uh, media is files that get uploaded by the user and static are provided by the application itself. Um, since they're not changing once they're uploaded, uh, they're provided out through Nginx. That means that there's no overhead of Python being involved in delivering those files. Um, and Nginx just, everything else that's not one of those two directories is just forwarded on to um, a socket on Circus D. So it has this sort of architecture um, for uh, how they're connected together. And um, Circus uh, manages sockets and workers, um, what it calls mon um No, word's gone, sorry. Um, so you can have a circus basically means you, uh, you define some open sockets and it listens on them and it'll pass the socket when it receives a connection onto a web worker when it's when it makes a request when it, uh, when a connection is made on it um, and then you c there's uh, a variety it can monitors the workers and if um, you can say increase the number of workers and it'll um, spin up another one, and uh, if one crashes, it'll restart it. Um, so it does sort of that process monitor, uh, management like um, supervised D. Um, the web workers I use are Trosset. It's, um, uh, sorry, one step back. Circus and Trosset are both uh, projects of um, Mozilla. Uh, they, I believe they use it for their own some of their own services that they've um, developed. Um, Josette, which apparently is French for sock, which makes sense with sockets, um, is designed for uh, basically running WSGI apps. Uh, it doesn't need to be Django, it can be Bottle or whatever. Um, and it specifically is designed to pick up the sockets that are provided by Circus and um, run HTD very simple HTTP server on it that uh, then sends the request onto the WSGI app that it's running. Uh, so it's very, very small footprint for that particular server. It's very, very simple. Um, has some neat options which I haven't used um, around using different um, uh, backends. So it supports things like Waitress and uh, some of the other ones which I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but I'll just quickly run over the Circus Config because it sort of sounds a bit odd at this stage, but hopefully this makes it a little bit more concrete. So um, the first thing we've done here is to find a socket for BD Web. Um, so it's listening on localhost. There's no point talking to the internet uh, on a particular port, 8080 in this case. Um, and Watcher, that was the name I was looking for. Uh, we've also defined a Watcher. And this is one of the processes that um, Circus will manage. And if, uh, if it crashes, it'll be restarted. And um, you can also change the number of processes. Um, so you can see here I'm running a... Uh, Virtual env called env. Hold on, mouse. 
Come on, mouse. Ah. Um, so we run set out of the virtual env that we're running on. Uh, we pass in this the file descriptor for that socket. Um, and so it's listening on that, and then it runs my WSGI application. Um, so it's a very simple setup for that server. Uh, use sockets basically says replace this with the actual socket ID that's used. Because um, you can also use it, uh, use uh, set up a watcher that's just watching an application that's not passing any sockets to it. So you could run your Redis under that. If it crashes, it'll be restarted. Um, or your salary workers or whatever. Um, we define the number of processes. So uh, this is set to one because I, not many people look at my website, unfortunately. Um, but you can. This is where it initial. So the, the number it'll start to. Um, you can then use commands like uh, circus control incra. Um, BD web, and it will start another one, so it'll be two. Um, we define the user to run as, and this is probably one of the key parts of the, my setup is that I have each um, each application I host, I have on its own user, and this provides um, some isolation between the different uh, applications. And if one's compromised, hopefully it limits the the scope of of the um, any problems. Um, I also separate the user that runs the application from the user that owns the code and deploys it. Um, and we also provide a couple of, uh, an environment variable um, for the Python path, which just happens to point to the directory. Um, and it just makes all the includes and imports a bit easier. Um, yeah, so that's that. So deployment, I keep all my code in Git, um, and uh, the deployment user that I mentioned, I generate an SSH key for it without a pa uh, without a password. Yeah, it doesn't have it doesn't have a passphrase, um, so that when I do my um, scripting of the deployment, it can use that SSH key to retrieve the code from Git. Um, and the way that I automate that uh, script automate that uh, deployment is I use uh, Fabric and Cuisine. So uh, Fabric is a fairly low level um, run shell commands on a remote system. Uh, it uses the Paramico SSH library internally. Um, it's written in Python. The code, your, the actual script, is in Python, and um, you should be able to see that on the next slide when I give you an example. Uh, Cuisine is a plugin that goes on t that uh, extends that, and it provides much higher level interfaces. So it has things like uh, write this file, read this file, add this, add a user, um, install this package, uh, install this Python package if, into the system, Python. Um, and so it, it ultimately, for me, when I go to deploy my big digital website, I just type this command here. Very, very simple. Just one command, enter, goes, fetches it for, um, this is the update command, uh, updates from uh, from Git and runs a few more commands just to set up all the environment. So um, here's my Fabric script, or some facsimile of it. Um, so we define a task, and this is those, the task that's on the command line. And uh, we define the host, the, so the set of hosts that it runs on. Uh, Fabric provides this, and it has a variety of ways of doing this, including setting up things like uh, server roles, um, uh, um, sets of hosts and things like that. So there's quite a variety of ways of defining which host it is. You can also define it on the command line. Um, and then my Python method that it actually calls. And um, in this case, you know, the update up the, um, CD changes into a directory, uh, runs git pull, um, writes the dot environment, which I'll come back to in a bit, and runs the post upgrade steps at the bottom. Uh, the method uh, function at the bottom, um, which basically just runs a whole lot of stuff, checks if a file exists, or run, 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 run. Um, so it runs all the uh, manage check, manage migrate, manage pi, click static. Uh, and then at the end, it does a circus reload BD web. And it does this in a really neat way. Um, so if I have, say, two runners, uh, two, two processes set up on in circus for my BD web, it will start a new one, tell, terminate the oldest one, 
start up another new one and then terminate the next oldest one. So it'll, without interruption and keeping at least two running at any one time, it will basically provide continuous service. So zero downtime updates. If the update actually works in that way and the old version works when, when the migra migrations have been applied. Little trick to learn to, yeah. Um, yeah, let's not do that. Um, this is sort of the deployment side, so you can see we've got a few more um, uh, different commands that are coming out of uh, Cuisine. Uh, do ensure, make sure a directory exists and you can provide a, a, um, an owner. Uh, you can see that it sets up a static media um, owned by different users, so the run user has to own media because it has to write into it. Um, we, get, uh, we do our um, uh, git clone to actually download the code, write thing. We run the same post update steps and we write the configuration and the more configuration and the more configuration and it keeps going and going. And eventually reloads everything and it starts running. Um, so it's a, Fabric is a really neat way of um, remotely executing commands. And uh, Cuisine makes it a lot easier to define at high level, you know, create this user, create this directory, um, write this file. So the, the last of sort of the key components in my environment is uh, Django Environ. Um, so this isn't actually specific to Django, despite its name. Um, but the key thing is, do not store secret key or DB passwords or AWS keys um, in your settings file that you then commit to public SVN or Git or anything like that. That's a really bad idea. You will have a bad day one eventually. Um, so Django Environ allows us to separate those key settings and this is, I find it quite useful for separating out um, when we run on say a different host that the host specific settings go into and uh, either come from the environment or from a particular file that we write, the .in file that I mentioned before. Um, and it has a whole lot of um, path utils as well. So um, reading from, um, so okay, quick question. Who here has read the 12 Factor Apps Manifesto? A few people. Okay, for those that don't know, um, there is this thing called the 12 Factor App. And uh, it's basically a way of deploying scalable, uh, a set of suggestions for how to deploy scalable uh, web applications. I think originally coming from out of the Ruby community, I think. Um, so we might be able to correct me on that. Uh, but basically it suggests that um, all the changeable configuration should come in environment variables. Um, and uh, Heroku is um, a good example where that actually happens. Um, so they provide your um, uh, your database configuration as of, as provided to your app through an environment variable. Um, I was particularly when I was first setting this up, I was writing commands on the on the remote command line by hand, uh, having to remember to put in environment variables, kind of hard. So um, being able to read that from file is really really handy. Um, so this is what the top of my settings.py file looks like in um, a lot of my Django applications. So we port environ and uh, root here is um, set up as the root directory of the project that I'm deploying. So the file, it's two up from the, where that file is. So the one up would be the directory that file's in, the settings.py file is in, and one's the one above that, which is where hopefully my manage.py script is, for example. Um, an envir uh, inf um, is set up to be the, um, read the environment variables, and we also set up a, a casting and, and default value for debug, default to off for debug. Um, and then we read it from, uh, read the rest of the settings from file. Um, and so you can see how further down the bug, we just load it up from inf because there's a default set um, it'll always work. Um, but secret key here, I have it set, uh, there's no default set there or anything, so um, if it's not provided either from the environment or from file, uh, it'll actually throw a improperly configured exception, which is very handy, particularly for secret key, because you want that to be, you know, there, and you also don't want it to be committed in code. Um, 
It also has a variety of other helpers. Um, the Django environment also has a, lot, a few other useful helpers. Um, Django D, uh, MDB, sorry, uh, is one of those, which uh, takes, um, by default, looks for a, an environment variable or a variable from your file called database URL. And it parses the URL into the um, various dictionary of settings that are required by Django. Um, and here I've um, set the default here so that in development I don't have to set it to something useful, so it just defaults to um, an SQLite database in the root of my uh, uh, of my checkout, um, which uh, makes it very handy. Um, so you can also see how you could use root um, root plus say templates in your template directories or um, root dot static const or static or whatever you want to call it um, in your static directories. Um, and env can be used for anything. A default gives you back a string, but you can get um, bulls, floats, um, integers, a few others. Um, there's also a couple of other helpers, like uh, I think there's cache, which is one of the newer ones that are in there. Um, and very much that's uh, very, very much based on uh, DJDB URL, I think the package was called. Um, and there's a variety of other ones that are very similar. So this sort of brought them all together in one place, um, which I think is a really, really neat tool. So here's an example of an env file, .env file. Um, so debug to false, yay, debug to false. Um, and no, that it definitely is not my secret key. Um, but you can sort of see how the database URL is set there, um, passing through the database user, the password, the host name, and the schema. Um, and it supports a bunch of things, including the um, uh, GeoDjango databases and everything like that. Um, you don't have to have a .env file. You could set them as um, environment variables. Say you could do that in your um, um, in your circus config. Um, so I set the Python path there because I really needed to. Um, but you could do that. But Heroku does it. This, uh, passes it through environment variables. So it actually provides quite a lot of flexibility using um, Django Environ. So one last look at the approach. Yes. Um, so it's quite, it's not sort of a single thing that, I've, uh, that I have, it's sort of a collection of tools that work very, very well together. Um, so some alternatives. Yeah, I mentioned Heroku a couple of times. Um, Google App Engine, Gondor, uh, Elastic Beanstalk, OpenShift, uh, they're all sort of ones you can go out and buy hosting with. A um, couple you can run yourself. Honcho. Honcho is written in Python, and it is basically a... How to describe it? It is a Python re-implementation of a Ruby tool called Foreman, and Foreman is pretty much what Heroku provides. Uh, so, <laughs> roundabout. Um, but it is kind of a neat way. I, I think it's kind of neat in one sense that you can run in pretty much the same environment that you deploy in in your testing or your de or development. Um, whereas I tend to run slightly different environments, but I have an explicit testing environment um, separate. Um, there are a couple other sort of platforms as a service out there. Um, OpenShift is in both columns because I believe you can get it hosted from Red Hat, but it's open source. Um, so you can um, run it yourself. Cloud Foundry is another one that's open source. I'm sure there's others. Does anybody want to yell out a suggestion? No? I think that's most of them. So very quickly, the future. Can't mention the future without mentioning Docker or containerization, which is similar sort of things. But basically, stronger separation, but not complete separation. Uh, but better control of the environment. Mm, maybe one day I'll do that, but it wasn't really around when I set up my environment. Um, and System D provides a lot of the sort of um, uh, process control and socket activation like Circus does. So I haven't yet had a chance to have a decent look at it. <laughs> mm. um, but it may well have the sort of um, pieces of the puzzle that would mean that we wouldn't need Circus. 
probably still need to see it because we need something that actually translate HTTP into something sensible. And you probably still need, uh, you know what, maybe not. And it was still wasn't around when I set this up. So um, there's some links and is there any questions? He's going to run around with the microphone. Yes, I will. So. Uh is it on? I hope so. I can't hear myself here up here. That's really bad. So uh, first of all, let's uh, thank Lee for his talk, please. <laughs> and then if there are any questions, uh, we have about five minutes. <laughs> Am I going to build a Docker con uh, container for my setup? Um, not in the near future because I haven't managed to get it running yet. Docker, that is. Um, I'm much too busy in my day job. Any other questions? There's one. Um, I was just curious if you tried uh, reducing the size of the VM you're using and at what stage it might just not work for you. <laughs> Because so, uh, I was sort of wondering just how far you could go. <laughs> yeah, so part of the limitation is just how many apps I'm running and, and how they use that memory. Um, that uh, GovHack one actually was crashing out, out of memory um, when somebody did the wrong thing quite often. Um, so it's not actually running just at the very second, but normally it would run okay. Um, I have been down as low as about 300 meg. And honestly, the hosting I provide, they're great people but it's still not that much cheaper. <laughs> so um, it, it very much just depends on how much memory your process ends up using. Circus is very small. Chaucet is extremely small, a couple of hundred K at most. Sorry, I just thought I should say this as well. As you were talking about alternative providers, uh, NZ Pug's website is sponsored by Gondor.io, which is, um, they provide the hosting kindly and they provide a similar-ish service to Heroku. They do. Um, you, somebody up there mentioned uh, Git tags. Yes, I probably should be using that, but it's just me that pushes. So I just run off master head. Yes, one more. Uh, I'm just wondering how you would manage your environment files. Would you keep them in a separate Git repo, or and how do you how do you handle the difference between the environments if you have um, dev test production, how do you do that? That's um, a good question and something that on occasion I struggle with. <laughs> um, so there's been a variety of different ways um, that I've done it. Sometimes I've, <sighs> the top of my favorite file has the passwords and stuff defined in it, um, which is committed into a separate Git repository, uh, but not the greatest solution. Um, the most common one is that I don't actually write, rewrite it every time I um, do an update. I only write it on the first one, and I transiently create passwords and set up the database, set up the hosting, set up everything, and it's just written into the .m file, and that's the only place it exists after, once that, call, uh, once that uh, script is finished. And that works okay as well. And eventually I want to put it in a database that I can secure somewhere off-site. So uh, ultimately, it's one of those things that just about every tool struggles with. Um, I know that you know people starting out with, say, Puppet or something like that often end up hard coding passwords in it because it's the easiest way to do it when they're just learning. And yeah, it, it, it becomes tricky, and you learn as you move forward. So it's, pro it's probably the one weakness about the way that I have my Fabric script set up at the moment. We got time for about one more question. And if there are no questions, please um, thank Lee again.